In this video, we're going to talk about how to take that molecule you've built with Gauss View and run a calculation on it. So in this case, I've drawn a formaldehyde molecule, and I want to go ahead and set up my calculation. So I'm going to come up here to the Calculate menu and do Calculation Setup. And that will open up this window here, where we have all the different options. Now, not every possible Gaussian keyword and so on is listed in here. The Gauss View interface lists many of the most common features, but there's a lot more power and flexibility if you start manually editing your input files. So I encourage you to start learning how to do that as you go. But for your beginning jobs and first jobs that you run in this course, you should go ahead and just use this Gaussian setup to get familiar with the program. So the first thing you want to do is set up the job type. So the type of calculation I'd like to do here is I'd like to predict the vibrational frequencies of this formaldehyde molecule. So I'm going to select the job type. And if I pull down this drop down menu, you see there's a bunch of different types of jobs. Energy is what it sounds like. It will just simply calculate the energy of your molecule in the geometry you have specified. So in the particular geometry that I have drawn down here. Optimization will then do a calculation in which you vary the nuclear positions in order to minimize the energy. So trying to find the minimum on the potential energy surface. Now in general this will be a local minimum, the minimum closest to the structure that you give as your input guess because it's just following the energy downhill into the nearest valley. And so if you have a complicated molecule with many different minima, you may need to create different possible input structures and perform optimizations on each of those to relax into the various different local minima and discover which is the most stable one overall. For a frequency calculation, you can use this. But remember, it's important for a frequency calculation that you have already minimized your structure if you've at the same level of theory as the one at which you're doing the frequency calculation, the exact same level of theory, same basis set, same method, and so on. If you haven't already minimized it, there's this handy combination of op plus freak, which will first do the optimization and then perform the frequency calculation on that optimized structure. So that's the one you're more often going to use for doing a frequency calculation. There are also a few other options here. IRC is something called an intrinsic reaction coordinate. So when you do a transition state search, you'll find your transition state, but occasionally it's not obvious what reaction that transition state is the transition state for. You may have a complicated molecule with many different possible reactions. So IRC will basically follow the eigenvectors, the vibrational frequencies downhill from your transition state towards reactants and products to help you get a better understanding of what transition state you found. So that can be useful sometimes for confirming that you found the correct transition state for the reaction you're interested in. A scan is a Oh, method for doing a series of calculations along a coordinate. You can, for example, look at what happens to the energy as I stretch the CO bond. And there's you can do that in different ways, either where you allow the other atoms to relax as you optimize all other atoms for a given fixed length of the CO bond. Or you can do it in a rigid scan where you literally, no other atoms move and you just vary the CO bond length. Stability analysis is if you have some concerns about whether your Hartree-Fock or DFT calculation has converged to a true minimum. That doesn't happen too often, isn't a problem too often with normal organic molecules, but occasionally you may wish to do that. And finally, NMR, it would be for doing NMR chemical shielding calculations on your molecule. For right now, we're going to do the opt plus frequency. Uh, you notice we're optimizing to a minimum. You could also optimize to a transition state and so on, but we're not going to worry about that now. There are various other options here. None of these are too important for a basic frequency calculation. So I'm going to come over to the method tab. And you can see that we are focusing on a ground state calculation. There are some methods for doing side state calculations, but again, we're not going to get to those yet. And then we have to set the particular model we're using. So for example, we might do a Hartree-Fock calculation. We might do a density functional theory calculation, some correlated calculations, semi-empirical, molecular mechanics, and so on. In this case, we'll do a density functional theory calculation. 
We haven't yet talked about this, but there are different ways you can handle spin, restricted, unrestricted, or restricted open shell. These has to have to do with, particularly if the electrons are not all paired up, well, how do we handle the orbitals for the spin up versus spin down electrons? We'll talk about that later in the course. So we're going to leave that to default for now. And we have to pick our density functional. For now, I'm going to pick the common B3 LYP functional. We also need to pick the basis set. Uh, we'll again talk about these different basis sets in a later lecture. I am going to, I want a calculation that's going to run very fast for this demonstration, so I'm going to pick the smallest one, STO3G. Now, mind you, this one will not give very accurate results in terms of predicting experimental quantities, but it's nice for running a quick calculation that finishes very rapidly. And our molecule is overall neutral, charge zero, and has all electrons paired singlet. And you'll notice the things we're selecting here are being written in this string up here. So this is the string that actually gets created in Gauss and, and goes into the input file. So it can be a useful way to learn about how to create Gaussian input files manually by paying attention to what happens to this string as I pick different options. For example, if I change the basis set, it changes the string right there. If I change the functional, it changes it right there, and so on. So you can learn a lot about Gauss, the structure of Gaussian input files from that. Titles are optional, but it's a good way to include some comments about your job. So for example, I'm just going to write formaldehyde. Frequency calculation. And that way you can help remember what you're doing later on. I encourage you, particularly if you're using a geometry from earlier jobs, you might want to add some comments in here about the fact that you got this from some other job that you did. For example, uh, B3LYP 631GD calculation or something like that. Link 0 has various options for interfacing with your um, hardware, essentially. So you can, for example, change how much memory you're allocating to it. And I would recommend using either, these days probably gigabytes. It would be this typical unit of memory you'd want to use. Now, these, a calculation like this doesn't require much memory at all, but I'm just going to tell it one gigabyte. It'll actually only use a fraction of that. Um, in general, you can give it up to a sizable chunk of whatever the memory you have on your machine is. Of course, your operating system and any other things you're running on the machine would also need some of the memory, so you don't want to give it 100% of the memory on your machine, but you can give it a good chunk of it. The checkpoint is where it stores a lot of detailed information that it, from which it can calculate molecular orbitals and other possible quantities. The default name for that is usually fine. Um, and then the other thing you might want to do here sometimes is the shared processor. So by default, it'll run this job on a single core, but most of us have multi-core chips in our computers these days. You might have a dual core or a quad core or more. And so depending on that, you may wish to specify to use more cores. So for example, we could tell it to use four cores on my quad core machine here. That said, you should be aware that really small jobs like this don't benefit from multiple processors. Um, there's some, you, you can use some trial and error over time, but um, something like this, there's really not going to be, it's going to run fast and there's going to be no benefit from using more than one core. So I'm just going to leave it at one core. There are various other things you can do. For example, we could turn off the use of symmetry. Um, we can turn off this connectivity data. So this geom equals connectivity is just storing anything about the way we've drawn them what the molecule here in terms of what's a single bond, what's a double bond, and so on. Again, that's just for the cartoon. If you don't want that information in your input file, it's totally optional. You could turn that off. Um, you could turn up the print level, which m would make it print additional information in your output file, and so on. Um, again, for most of these things, we don't need to worry about them now. The initial guess can be important sometimes, but and this is the initial guess wave function, but again, we don't really need to worry about it now. Um, there's NBO, which are natural bond orbitals, which is an analysis technique. Salvation models, in case you want to do some sort of implicit solvent modeling. And you can just create freeform input here or here. Now, if you want to see the actual input file let's create, or you want to edit it manually, you can come down here to this edit button. It's going to ask you to save it first. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. I'll just call this test. Um, 
and then here it's opened up in a little text editor my input file and so you can see here is created the input file defining that we're using one core one gigabyte of memory uh, we're, this is the test checkpoint file it's using here's my command string blank line comment line blank line Cartesian coordinates and the charge and spin state blank line common connectivity data saying atom 1 is bonded to atom 2 with a double bond to atom 3 with a single bond and atom 4 with a single bond and then listing the other atoms and then again a blank line at the end of the file without which Gaussian will crash. So in principle I could go ahead and edit this here but I'm not going to make any changes. Alright and now it's asking me am I ready to submit the file and I am so I'll hit OK. This calculation should only take a minute or two to run while it runs, we can look at a few of uh, the other features here. Um, oh, actually, it's done. So, a typical job will create both a checkpoint file and a log file. The log file is a plain text file that you can open with any text editing file. The checkpoint file is a binary file that contains lots more information about the wave function and so on. So, many of the properties you want to look at can be obtained directly from the checkpoint or from the log file but occasionally for things like molecular orbitals and some other things that really need to be computed from the wave function you need the checkpoint file. So I'm just going to open the log file now. Um, there is this option where you can read intermediate geometry so if you wanted to look at an animation of your geometry optimization you might do that to see how it's changing because then it would read all the possible geometries that it went through during the optimization so you can make a little movie of that but I'm just going to, I'm just interested here in the optimized geometry and the frequencies, so I'm not going to check that. I'm just going to open the log file. It now opens a new window with my optimized geometry in it. In this case, we can't really tell the difference because it looks about the same. And then I can come up here and do results summary. And that opens this little window where you can see it's, it's picked a few of the most common properties you might care about. It's telling me about what method I used. Here's my final energy in heart trees. Uh, this is just telling us it's how tightly it converged, uh, that there were no imaginary frequencies for this case, meaning we found the minimum energy structure, so it's a stable species. It also is telling us the point group and the dipole moment of this. If we want more information, we can also view the file. And here it's opening up the log file. And so you can see here are all the details. There's a lot more information in this log file. It takes a little while to learn how to read one, but I have a handout on iLearn that shows you how to interpret at least some of the features in here. But in this case, we're interested, well, we might first look at the charge distribution, perhaps interested in what are the partial charges on these. Um, we can, for example, show the dipole vector in this um, and you can make that bigger smaller and uh, so this is just showing us how the dipole is oriented we can also look at the vibrations and so here we have the six different normal modes it calculated for this their frequencies and by default it calculates their infrared intensities you can also request Raman intensities that takes a bit of extra calculation so it's a little more expensive so it doesn't do it by default but you can select that when you're setting up the input file but so for example if I click mode 6 that around 3255 wave numbers I can hit the animation you can see this is an asymmetric stretch of the hydrogens here's a symmetric stretch of the hydrogens there's another scissoring motion, second one, and then rocking motions of the hydrogens. And so these are the six different normal modes. Nice animations. Now of course perhaps you need to put these in a presentation and don't necessarily want the um, animations in there. You can also have it show the uh, displacement vectors to show how these atoms move in your different animations and so on and you can also hit spectrum and get a simulated IR spectrum and if we had done more Raman calculations and so on it would also show that as well now again just be aware that the peak positions are calculated by these frequencies the peak widths here are arbitrary they've just made up a 
peak width for each of these. I think they just pick something like 10 wave numbers. You can probably even change it somewhere in the code. Um, and so the, the relative heights are meaningful, but the shapes of the peaks are not meaningful. So don't put too much stock in these. These are really, again, just for making pretty pictures. Um, but it is a nice way to visualize and compare your predicted spectrum against an experimental one. All right, uh, with that, that's a basic introduction to how you can run a calculation with Gauss View. Hope it was helpful.